Our last section of Chapter 10 deals with work and rotational kinetic energy. Back in Chapter 7, we learned the work kinetic energy theorem that says the net work done on an object results in a change in its kinetic energy. And the equation for translational motion was delta K was one-half mv final squared minus one-half mv initial squared. Now for rotational motion, we're going to replace the kinetic energies of translational motion with kinetic energy of rotational motion. So our new work kinetic energy theorem comes out to be one-half I omega final squared minus one-half I omega initial squared. We also learned that for, for translational motion, the work done by a force was the integral of the force times the displacement. And for a constant force, that's simplified to force times distance. Once again, we're going to replace our linear variables with rotational variables. Force is replaced by a force that produces rotation, or torque, and dx is replaced with d theta, the angular displacement. And again, for a constant torque, this should a constant force at a constant radius producing a constant torque, this will turn out to be torque times angular displacement. And we also learned for translational motion that power is the rate, dt, the rate at which work is done. And we showed that that's also equal to force times velocity. Now with rotational motion, we'll replace force with torque and linear velocity with angular velocity so that power is equal to torque times omega. And table 10-3 on page 261 now summarizes all that we've learned about translating uh, the translational equations and variables to rotational equations and variables. Position x translates to angular position theta. Linear velocity translates to angular velocity omega. Linear acceleration a translates to angular acceleration alpha. Mass translates to moment of inertia. Newton's second law for linear motion was net force equals mass times acceleration. Now for rotational motion, net torque equals I times alpha. Work is the integral of force with respect to displacement. Now with rotational motion, work is the integral of torque with respect to angular displacement. Kinetic energy for linear motion, one-half mv squared. For angular motion, one-half i omega squared. Power for linear motion, force times velocity. Power for rotational motion, torque times omega. And the work kinetic energy theorem holds true for both. Just that one-half mv squared is our kinetic energy for translational motion and one-half I omega squared is our kinetic energy for rotational motion. Sample problem. I forgot the number of it, but it's the one with the falling chimney. So let's assume we're going to let this represent a chimney, a very tall smokestack. And one day we decide it needs to come down. It's, it's served its purpose, and now we need to tear it down. So we're going to blow up or knock out the base of it, and it falls over, okay? In the sample problem, they ask, if it starts here, what is its angular speed, omega, when it reaches the point where the angle between the chimney and the vertical is 35 degrees? So let's draw a picture of that. Here we go, here's our chimney, and when it reaches 35 degrees, how fast is the chimney rotating now? What is its omega? So we're going to use conservation of mechanical energy to do this problem. Uh, we know that falling objects, they start off with potential energy, and as they fall, that potential energy trans, uh, becomes kinetic energy, right? So that's what we're going to do here. Initially, it's at rest, so there is no kinetic energy, and it has potential energy, and then at some later time point, which we've chosen that to be when the angle is 35 degrees, it will have kinetic energy of rotation now, which is one half i omega squared, 
and whatever potential energy is left over. So how do we calculate potential energy? Because when you look at a chimney, you know, potential energy of gravity is MGH, but some of the chimneys up here, some of the chimneys here, some of the, the H value for all parts of the chimney is not the same. So how do we calculate the potential energy of this chimney? Uh, remember the center of mass is the point at which where all the mass can be treated as being there, right? So the, the center of mass of the chimney is right at the midpoint. So we can use the midpoint as H in our equation, MGH for potential energy. Where is the center of mass height? So if L is the length of the chimney, the center of mass is at L over 2. Okay. Then when it's at 35 degrees, if you look at this diagram here, as it falls, the radius of the circle that it's falling in is always L over 2. This is going to be where the center of mass is, and it will fall in that quarter of a circle uh, to the ground, and that's always L over 2. And H is the height of the center of mass. So using that right triangle there, I see that the height H is L over 2 times the cosine of 35 degrees, right? Adjacent to the 35 degree angle is uh, cosine when we use adjacent side. So L over 2 cosine 35 is my height at that spot of the center of mass. And we have to also figure out what is the moment of inertia of the uh, chimney. If you look at table 10-2, which tells you moments of inertia for a long, thin rod, which is what we're going to treat the chimney as, one long, th thin rod, it's 1 12th ml squared. But that's when it's rotating through its center of mass, right? The chimney now is rotating about its end point. So we have to use the parallel axis theorem, and that's I, the new moment of inertia is equal to the COM inertia plus mh squared, where h is the distance from the center of mass to the new axis of rotation. So that's half the length of the chimney. So h is going to be L over 2. And the ICOM is 1 12th ml squared. So my new moment of inertia, this is going to become ml squared over 4. And when I convert that to a common denominator, that will be 3 twelfths ml squared plus 1 twelfth ml squared for a total of 4 twelfths or 1 third ml squared. So there is my moment of inertia for a long thin rod about its end point. So that's what I put in here for I, I get 1 third ml squared. Okay, now I'm trying to solve for omega, what's the angular velocity of the chimney as it falls. So I could plug in all the numbers now, but that would be a lot more button pushing in my calculator. So I'm going to simplify it first by no noticing that every term has a one half. So I can cancel out the one half from every term. Every term has an m. So I'll divide that out of the equation. Every term has at least one l. There we go. Uh, now I want to solve for omega, so I'll take this term and bring it to the other side and factor out the g. Okay, and then I want to cross multiply this 3 to the other side. And I want to divide the l to the other side. And then I want to take the square root. And there is my expression for omega. So I know what g is, I know what the length of the chimney is, I can get my answer for omega, and, and I'm done. <clears throat> but something very interesting happens when this chimney falls over. It's a very tall chimney. And when we went outside into the quad and did our game, you know, where we all held hands and moved in the semicircle, the person near the axis of rotation, they didn't have to move very fast at all. The person near the outside of the circle, they had to run to keep up. So the same idea is happening here with the, with the chimney. As it falls, the highest point of the chimney has to go very fast. Points on the chimney down here near the axis of rotation go very slow. If we compare those velocities, those linear velocities, 
to what velocities would be in free fall, we notice that the end of the chimney up here, the top of the chimney, is having to go faster than free fall. And the parts down here near the base of the chimney are having to go more slowly than free fall. So we know that if something is going to go faster than free fall, it needs an additional force pushing on it, not just the gravitational force. So the rest of the chimney is trying, this part down here is trying to go faster. This part up here is saying, no, I don't want to go that fast. So this tends, and, this, and the, the chimney tends to bend like this, okay? And it feels stress in this, like this, to make it do that. And sure enough, if you look at pictures of chimneys as they fall, that's what happens to them. Okay. This is an old picture. It looks to me like this is a brick chimney from the, I don't know, 1800s, maybe early 1900s. But I was able to find a video online of a more recent, here we go, 2003. Check it out. And these chimneys, I think, are a little sturdier than that brick chimney, so they don't break apart until they're very close to the ground. So keep watching them all the way down, and you'll notice they do, in fact, break apart. Oh, look, there's one. Oh, look. Oh, my goodness. I remember when I was a kid in my neighborhood where I lived, there was a very large billboard at the end of the street. There was a big parking lot, there's a church there and a big parking lot, and this giant billboard uh, for the main road, as cars drove by, they could see this billboard. And I guess one day it was time to tear it down. And so the whole neighborhood went to watch this gigantic billboard be torn down. And uh, the guy who was doing the demolition, he came over to the crowd of people and he said, I need your attention. I want you to know that when this billboard falls, it's going to act like a giant bellows and just blow all, you, you see all the dirt and smoke that arises from the falling. He said, it's just going to blow all this stuff. And so what you need to do is, you know, look away because it'll get in your eyes. And I was eight years old, you know, I'm like, forget that, man. I want to see the thing hit the ground, right? That's cool. So sure enough, they cut it down and boom, it hit the ground. And all this dirt and cinder and it whoosh, into my eyes. Yeah. Ah! But gosh darn it, I got to see that billboard hit the ground. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> <Did> I die. <laughs>